I got um, yesterday. Start talking about this interval notation. Okay. Um, key thing to remember is that interval notation is something that you need to buy into immediately. Okay. Uh, because it is going to be the number one way we present solutions. Uh, it's going to be the number one way we talk about domains and ranges uh, for functions and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's not going to go away. Okay. So if it's something that you don't really pick up today or tomorrow, you can't be okay with that. You have to take the steps to, to resolve those issues or you're going to fall behind fast, okay, because this is, this is a very critical component, okay. Um, as we investigate interval notation, one of the ways of doing that, because we have infinite solutions with these things most of the time, is to talk about inequalities. When we get through our examples here with linear inequalities, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the algebra because you spent time in algebra one solving linear inequalities. We did it in geometry and you should have done it in Algebra 2, okay? Um, so that being said, I want to spend a bulk of today talking about different ways we might be presented with an inequality, how we have to grasp that, and how we take that information and convert it over into interval notation, which is a much simpler way of producing and showing answers. But because of that, and this is something in mathematics that happens a lot, when we want simplicity, Okay? We want to be concise. A lot of times we lose context. We lose, uh, it just becomes kind of abstract sometimes, all right? Um, but if we understand what we're trying to, to say, then we should be okay. Um, so yesterday we talked about X being greater than 5. We graphed it. Okay, we took this little line here, this vertical line. And this is not, this is not a practice that we should, we should do all the time. Um, like physically write a graph down and then draw this bar. But this is always the kind of the mental approach that should be taking place as you write an interval down, okay? We took this bar and we started traveling it through our number line until we came to our first solution. And our first solution is not 5, but that's the first marking on our graph, right? The first solution is actually 5.0. Say that as many times as you possibly could and slap a 1 on the end. And that's the first number to the right of 5 that we want to include, right? That's the first number bigger than 5 if we look over here at our inequality. That's how we show that then in our interval notation. Okay? This symbolism right here with the 5 in the parentheses says we're not going to include 5, but we're going to include the first, the most immediate number to the right of 5. And that's exactly what this is saying here. Okay? As we move that purple bar all the way through then, Okay, because of the arrow on that red line, that tells us we keep going forever, correct? And that's why we have this symbolism of infinity. Okay, and we talked yesterday at the end that, you know, if I know what infinity is numerically, you can add one to it, and now we have a new infinity, right? And we keep doing that back and forth. So we always put a parenthesis on infinity because we don't know its exact value because it doesn't exist as a value. Does that make sense? So what I want to do is go through here uh, with some different examples of different um, graphical approaches and then see how does that compare uh, in our interval notation. So the next one is X is greater than or equal to five. Um, so again, we're gonna graph our line. We're gonna find five. Okay, now greater than or equal to, greater than or equal to, from like algebra two, algebra one, what kind of dot would you use there? A closed dot, okay? And then to the right of five, we would graph again, right? Okay, so if you think about taking that purple bar again and dragging that through our graph, what is the first number you come across? Five, so I'm gonna write five down for my interval notation. As I drag that purple bar again, what's the last number you'd come in contact with? Infinity. I know infinity has a parenthesis. That's always a given. But now this 5, we don't want to write it like we did up here because this meant we kicked it out, right? So with the 5, we're actually going to include it, so we need a new notation. And if I'm going to include a value, I use a square bracket. Okay. So square bracket means that we're including 5. 
when you, so I'll just write this down here. So inclusive graphically, you guys have talked about using a closed dot. Okay. That is the same. We're going to actually, in our graph, instead of using a closed dot, we can actually draw the bracket in our graph. So what that would look like is you would have, Like you would draw that blue graph. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, that 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 technique is actually used more in our textbook than the closed dot, open dot. They're both used, but the the square bracket is used the most. Um, so inclusive, solid dot bracket, and remember that comes from knowing that we had greater than, less or greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. Okay. Exclusive means it's not included or it's excluded. Okay, remember that's an open dot, which yields a parenthesis. And these parentheses are brackets, obviously they can go in either direction, um, which that then means we were dealing with less than or greater than. Is okay with everybody? All right. Um, let's do this next one, X is less than five. I can get a better number line here. There we go. So if X is less than five, we're going to go to five. Okay. Now we're going to we're going to shade to the left of it, right? Now what kind of dot or um, be an open dot? So I'm going to use in this case I'm going to use a parenthesis just to show the the kind of the variation. So I'm going to put a parenthesis at five, and I would shade that direction, right? So now in that picture, if I'm going to take this purple line and think about the first number that purple line comes in contact with, it would be what? Negative infinity. And what would be the last number it comes in contact with? Five. Okay. Negative infinity obviously has the parentheses on it. The reason our text likes to use parentheses in the graph is because it gives you an idea when you write your from your graph to your interval notation, it automatically tells you what you need to put on the five. On the graph, it had a parenthesis, right? So on my interval notation, it better be a parenthesis. So that's more of a seamless kind of one-to-one -one correspondence that makes things a little bit easier for you to take information from the graph and put it in an interval notation. You okay with that? Okay, next one would be Ah, oh, it's a pain in the butt. There we go. Um, well, what in the... There we go. I'm zoomed in so far that it's not letting me cut and paste things anywhere I want to. Um, X is less than or equal to 5, right? So again, find 5. Now, open dot, close dot. Close dot. I'm going to use a bracket, though. Square bracket, because that means inclusive, right? And now I'm going to shade to the left. All right, so once we do that, then, what would be the first value that this line comes in, that purple line comes in contact to or with? negative infinity, and it's going to go up to 5, parenthesis around negative infinity, bracket around 5. Is that all right? Okay. So those are all our examples that involve infinity. You see that every time infinity is used, it's a parenthesis. Um, one thing you got to pay attention to is that your interval should be chronological, meaning the number that comes first should be further to the left than the number that comes second. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, a lot of people tend to get that mixed up, messed up. Um, we will eventually use interval notation for vertical number lines, essentially our y-axis. And what we mean then, the number that is further to the left should be the number that is lower on the y-axis than the number on the right. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Um, let's do this next one, zero to five. So on my number line, obviously I got zero, I've got five. Now what do I use at zero? Open, okay? So I'm gonna use a parenthesis. What do I use at five? Bracket. And my solutions, this is referred to as, you guys remember that's a between statement. Because X is now between zero and five, right? So when I graph my solutions, I can use that idea to tell me my solutions are between zero and five. Now, what is nice, especially here, because I use the parenthesis and bracket, I know I should have parenthesis on zero, bracket on five. Again, it's left to right, correct? I think these people people actually have more success with these, even though they're later in my explanation, but that people have more success with these than they do with the infinity ones. Um, the next one is zero to five. Zero to five again, right? These are the same statement, but what do I put on zero? Bracket, and what do I put on five? Parenthesis, right? Okay. Those two answers look drastically similar, right? Okay, and they are very similar in terms of solutions because there's infinite number of solutions, right? So they share an infinite number of solutions, but there are two numbers up there, zero and five, that are not being shared, correct? Okay, so if you're a person that does all the work and you write your, uh, any, the, the inequality um, satis or is satisfied by maybe uh, that bottom interval notation, but you write the one above it, you're very close, but you're very wrong too. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so we just got to be, be cautious of that. There's, there's a lot of times in this class that a parenthesis versus a bracket can make the entire difference on whether you get points for that question or not. All right. Um, that's why we spent, we're going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, let's do this real quick. This isn't on your handout, or your, I guess your notes that you printed off if you printed them. Um, let's do something like this. What if I said, we're just going to draw some graphs here and then write the interval notation from those graphs. So we go through some algebraic process, um, and we come up with the fact that this graph is our set of solutions, okay? Everything that's red up there between negative 12 and 7 and everything from 18 to 30 is going to be a solution. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, now the question is, how do I write that in an interval notation? Because if that's my solution, for, for me as a student to present that, to an audience, I have to show them the graph, and that's a pain in the butt, right? Okay. Um, if I want to verbalize that, that's hard to verbalize. Okay. But if we change it into interval notation, it's very easy to verbalize, very easy to communicate what my solutions are. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at just this set of solutions right here. Okay. So that set of solutions, first number you come in contact with, if I drew that vertical bar again, first number I come in contact with would be negative 12, right? Keep dragging that vertical bar. What would be the last number you come in contact with? Seven. Now, did I really come in contact with negative 12? No. So I need to put a parenthesis there, right? Because I came in contact with negative 11.9999999 forever, not negative 12. Did I come in contact with seven? Yes. Okay. I always like to like visually put myself, if I'm, if I'm questioning what's going on, I put myself on the line and I ask myself, okay, if it's a closed dot, I can stand on that point. If it's an open dot, I fall through. Does that make sense? And if I fall through, that needs to be a parenthesis. If I can stand on it, it needs to be a bracket. So that's what I got there. Now, in my answers, I cannot include 7 to 10, right? Those are not solutions. 
So what I need to do is I need to come up with a way of talking about the next set of solutions there in green. So if I do that, first one, so still moving, moving this bar all the way through here, right? Okay. Last solution so far was seven. Now, none of these can be solutions, so we skip them, and we get to 18, right? So 18 needs to be my next number that I use. So I'm going to say 18. And what's the last number I come in contact with? 30. Now, 18, does that get included or excluded? Included. And 30, excluded, right? Okay. Now, that's a better way of showing my solutions, but it's still not finalized. Okay. I have to put a symbol in there that says that I'm going to talk about the union of these two things. Say it again. Uh, technically, no, but WebAssign accepts a comma. Okay. What we usually use is this symbol here. Okay. And if you guys remember back to um, Algebra 1, Algebra 2, okay, when we did compound inequalities, the word or referred to what we called a union, okay? And union means that our solutions are everything from what I highlighted yellow along with Everything that I highlighted green, does that make sense? Okay. Um, if we were to go back and look at maybe the, the inequality that that graph comes from, those solutions come from, it's probably a compound inequality that actually says the word or in it. Okay. Um, or it might be a, uh, a nonlinear inequality, which you guys have no experience with, um, and we'll talk about how we solve those in, in the future. But that's the union. Does anybody remember the other key word that we talked about with inequalities? We had or, we had and. And an and was an intersection, right? Okay. But the union symbol is that, and the intersection symbol is that okay very rarely will we use the intersection symbol inside interval notation because if it's an intersection there's going to be better ways of writing the actual answer and I'll, we'll, we'll see an example of that here is that is that okay how we can kind of chunk pieces together or chunk solutions together all right let's do this example because this is a, a kind of a variation of that or a extension of that Let's say we have our number line again. Let's say we're going from negative 7 up to 12, okay? But let's say that whatever the equation or inequality this information came from, let's say that they had, it had an expression like 1 over x uh, plus 4. If we had 1 over x plus 4 in my original inequality, what value is x not allowed to be as an answer? negative 4. So I'm going to put negative 4 in here. And if I were to graph this, let's say that we had like negative 7 was okay. We can close that in. 12, let's say we could close that in. But because 4 was providing division by 0, we actually want to put an open dot there. And that image of our graph tells us everything from negative 7 to 12 is a solution except for where we've got open dots. So four cannot, or negative four cannot be a solution. Does that make sense? So now, instead of being able, instead of, think about how I just said that. I just said my solutions are from negative seven all the way up to 12, except for negative four, right? Is that a wordy statement? Okay. My hope is that we see that when we write it this way, I can go from negative seven, and I would include negative seven, right? Okay, because I got a closed dot there. Draw my vertical line here. My vertical line starts at negative 7. When I get here, can I really stand on negative 4? No, I'd fall through, right? So negative 4 can't be an answer, but can negative um, like 4.0000001 be an answer? 
Yeah, and I can't write that. Okay? So what I do is I just put negative 4 here, but I exclude it. Does that make sense? Is everybody okay with that? Then I'm going to jump over negative 4, and I'm going to have negative 3.9999999999 as the next number, right? The first value is immediately to the right of negative 4. Well, I can't write that number, so I write negative 4 again, and I put a parenthesis there. And I keep going until I get to my last value, which is 12, and that's closed. So I'll put a bracket. Okay? So this set of solutions is modeled right there. This set of solutions is modeled right there. We then union them. And that's a much easier, more efficient, more concise way of saying that my solutions are from negative 7 to 12, but we kicked out negative 4. All right? Is it okay there, everybody? If you're going to, so I always talk about kicking out a value, okay? If, if I didn't have that hole there on negative 4, my, my interval would be negative 7 to 12, right? So let's say, if that, let's say if this was a closed dot on negative 4, my solution would be negative 7 all the way up to 12, which is that number right there and that number right there, right? Okay, so it's kind of the bookends of uh, the statement. If there's any numbers that are inside from negative 7 to 12 that need to be removed, like negative 4, you will then always see something like that where I've got the negative 4, or the number that needs to be removed, a parenthesis with it, a union, and then a parenthesis in the opposite direction within that number negative 4 again. And that tells me visually that there's a hole there on the graph. We can do that as many times as we need to. We might have 3, 4, 5 different values between negative 7 and 12 that need to be kicked out, and we would do that for each one of them. Okay, so we can union. So far, we've only union two things. We can union three things, four things, five things, as many as we need to. Is that okay? Let's 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 talk real quick about, and then we'll get into some examples uh, with the inequalities. Let's talk about this idea. If I have, uh, let's just go from negative three to 10, and then here we'll go from like 0 to 15. And I'm going to put a blue graph, and let's put a red one. Just so I can talk about them easier, let's just say that this blue one is called, like the, the solution set's called A, and let's call the red one solution set B. Just so I can talk about it a little bit easier. So if I say I want to figure out the union, okay, which is, remember, union meant or, right? So I want to say the union of A and B, okay? So I want, I want to write a, an interval notation that, says, that shows the solutions for A union B, or that come from A or B, okay? So let's, let's just kind of do this real quick. Let's write um, just this blue interval. So would you guys agree this blue interval is from negative 3 up to 10, including 10? And then if I union that, would you guys agree that the red one, which is B, goes from 0 to 15. Okay. Now here's my question. Are there some numbers in here that go from, let's say, 0 up until 10 that are being displayed in both sets? So there's a better way of writing this. Does that make sense? So right now, I've in, in blue set and the red set, I'm redundant with some of my solutions. Is that what you're going to say, Anthony? So what do you what do you got to tell me is a better way of writing my answers? Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. So, but if, but if I, so, if, so you're saying put a 10, so 10, 10 should be a, a bracket, right? So you're saying rewrite this as 10 bracket 15, correct? Well, okay, so that that's that's debatable, okay. Um, but but think about that. Even if I write it this way, is ten included here? Is it included there? So why write it twice? Is th is that a better way of writing that first one? Is anything in that first one? Is anything excluded? When I write it as negative 3 to 15, is anything extra included when I write it as negative 3 to 15? Does that kind of make sense to everybody? Okay. So you might, you might be doing work, and then I see this all the time, especially when we talk about domains and ranges. People want to just uh, look at a graph and say, okay, these X values, union these X values, union these X values, or these Y values, union these Y values. But when they do that, they have overlap in which they could have been more concise with how they express their – their intervals. Does that make sense? Okay. So in like a web assign assignment or a test or a quiz, if you wrote negative three comma 10 union zero to 15, that's not wrong, but it's not the best way of writing it. Correct. I'd be looking for negative three to 15. Okay. If that were something that we do, maybe I circle it and maybe half a point off or something like that. Cause you could be better. It's like reducing things. We always want to reduce, right? But the but because of the or because it means solution so solutions from this one or solutions from that one so a solution when I pick off um, that solution right there does it work for a yeah so we're, these are solutions that work for a or b so because it's or it only has to work for one of them um, now if I did intersection. which that is and, now my solutions have to work for both. Yes. Okay, so, so let, let's write this this way. So, again, a lot of people might go, oh, negative 3 to 10, that is 1. And then intersection is that symbol, right? And then we'll go from, like, 0 to 15. Okay? But that's not as concise as possible because an intersection is, if we think about it graphically, it's the overlap, right? Okay. Well, don't they start overlapping right here in that region? And this is where, Keith, you said open, right? Open at zero. Now, do they, because they, they, zero has to work for both of them, right? It works for the bottom one, but it does not work for the top one. There's an open dot there. Does 10 work for both of them? So I can put a, a 10 with a bracket there. So that's is a better way of writing that topple. I know that's a lot thrown at you, and, and for the first time seeing it, it can be a little bit confusing. Um, I always like, like I said, draw that vertical line and say, okay, if it's an or statement, I just got to make sure that my vertical line is intersecting at least one of these um, bars, okay, uh, one of these graphs, and if it is, I just include those values in my interval, okay? If it's an and statement, then I need to make sure that that vertical bar crosses both of them, and at the points that it crosses both of those, those need to be part of my solution, okay? Um, and those, that becomes an issue when we start talking about compound inequalities. All right, so let's, let's do some inequalities. The, the, the inequalities we talked about today are just linear, so we solve them just like equations, right? What's the one difference of solving inequalities, linear inequalities, and linear equations? Okay, so if I multiply or divide by a negative, my inequality sign has to be switched in its direction, right? All right, so um, if I just kind of start distributing here, I get negative 4x plus 1 plus 2 greater than 3x, I'm actually going to write this as minus, or a negative x, minus 1. Is everybody okay with that? And this is, this is the thing I'm talking about, or I talked about previously. We should be able to solve that already, right? I, that, that math I'm not really uh, focused on 
trying to teach you because it should be a prerequisite. Um, so I get 3x um, over here. It's going to be, so I got 3, so this is, yeah, that's my fault. Um, so 6, what is that, 5? Is that okay with everybody? Or is it 7? It's actually 7. 6 plus 1, 7. <clears throat> so we get 7 thirds is greater than x. Is everybody okay with that? Now, I don't like 7 thirds greater than x because the way I'm going to graph things, the way I think about things visually in my mind without writing something down, I like my x to come first. Just be careful if you do that. If you use the symmetric property, the inequality still needs to be pointing towards what it was pointing to up here, right? So it's pointing towards the x up here, so it needs to be pointing towards the x down here. All right, so if I graph that, 7 thirds, open or close that? Open. So that would be equivalent to a parenthesis, right? And we'd be shading to the left in each of those, right? So when I write my interval notation, what's the first number over here I come in contact with? Negative infinity. And what's the last number that my line, my vertical line, would come in contact with? Seven thirds. Parenthesis on seven thirds. Is that okay? Stop me if we're going too fast. Jackson! What are we going to multiply the next one by? What are we going to multiply this one by? What is it? Twenty eight. Okay, so I multiply by twenty eight. So that's gonna give me what seven X plus thirty five? Uh negative four X plus sixteen. And then two. Is that okay there everyone? Uh three X plus fifty one is less than or equal to. 3x less than or equal to negative 49. x is less than or equal to negative 49 thirds, right? Is everybody okay with that? Stop me if we need to talk about how to solve these things. Um, I'm not going to graph this one. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, x is less than negative 49 thirds. So I'm thinking about, okay, what numbers are less than negative 49 thirds? All of them start at negative infinity, go up to negative 49 thirds, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Well, when I, so this, so when you have this here, it's going to be a negative 4, and you got your x minus 4. So when I distribute that, I got to have the, it's going to be a positive 16. Good question. Um, everybody all right with that? With the interval notation? Let's, let's do one. Good. All right, we already talked about the idea of and and or, okay, for compounding qualities. But remember, and means your solution satisfies both statements or means solution satisfies one or the other statement. Okay, that's what we mean by and or or inside these um,
compound inequalities, okay? This first one is a between statement, okay? Um, and you can solution. This first statement right there, can I separate this and say negative 2 is less than 2x plus 3 and negative, or not negative, but 2x plus 3 is less than or equal to 15? Does that kind of make sense? That's how we would read this. We'd say negative 2 is less than 2x plus 3 and 2x plus 3 is less than or equal to 15. Okay, because these are the same, um, algebraic expressions here, I can take that 2x plus 3, and I can overlap them, right? Does that then give, I know it's messy here, but does that give me then this image here? Okay, um, if you're going to solve this one by itself, what would you do first? You would subtract 3 from both sides, right? If you're going to solve this one first, what would you do first? Subtract 3 from both sides. Is that the same operation in two different inequalities? So if we have it together at once here, this is the reason we solve between statements by subtracting from all parts, so all three, because if you were to break it apart, you'd have to solve these two individually, but the algebra is the same in them individually. Is that right? So it's going to give you what negative 5 is less than 2x, less than or equal to 12. Then what would you do? So you'd have negative 5 halves is less than x, is less than or equal to 6, right? Okay. The benefit of leaving it as a between statement like it was presented to us in the original problem is because when I'm done, I don't need to graph this now to get my answer to put it in uh, interval notation. That's one endpoint. And because it's less than, it's a parenthesis. This is another endpoint. And because it's greater than or equal to, or sorry, less than or equal to, it's a bracket. And I've got, my, I can just quickly, seamlessly give you my interval notation, right? Okay. You guys are familiar. This is... This solution here is probably the way you're most familiar with writing answers, right? Okay, and we've even taken liberties in how we should do that because traditionally you should write it this way. You should say, you should put a curly brace and say x such that negative 5 is 5 halves is less than x is less than or equal to 6, and then you put another curly brace there. That's called set builder notation. Okay, um, and this is called interval notation, right? Okay, which one is more concise, easier to, to understand? The sec or I guess more concise, I think it's easier to write, easier to understand is probably this one here. But we like to use that one the most. Okay. Um, Let's just do, uh, we do this example too. Because it says or, you have to do these individually, right? So I'll add 7 to both sides and then divide by 2. And I've got my or. I'll subtract 4 from both sides. Okay, so that's not hard, right? Solving those inequalities is something we all should be able to do. Now, I want to graph this. If, if you're a person that can do this without graphing, by all means, don't graph them, okay? But if you're a person that tries this without graphing them and gets them wrong all the time, graph them. The graph's going to help. So I find negative 2. This says x is less than negative 2, right? So I need to graph that way. This is x is greater or equal to 0. So I graph that way, right? How do I express these solutions right there in an interval notation? Okay. 
Now, how do you then express those solutions? Okay, so now how do I express that everything that I highlighted is a solution for here? What do I need to do with this stuff yet? I need to union them, okay? And what that means then is that these are all my solutions for which anything out of one of these intervals will either satisfy that or they will satisfy that. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, man. There, and it's in that tab. Uh, so so your, your union symbol is in that tab. And like I said, for convenience sake, WebAssign also, at least in the past, unless they've made an update, would accept a comma in place of the, the union symbol. But I, I, would tradi I would use the union symbol because your tests and quizzes are going to be, or your tests uh, and final are going to be by hand. Um, and that's what we'll be looking for. And that's, that's usually what you see, like, in a PDF or a, uh, a publication, you'll see that symbol. So we'll get used to that. Intersection. Yeah. We okay with this? All right. Again, I'm not worried so much about the algebra, but if we need assistance with that algebra, let me know. Um, I'm more concerned, and once we have solutions, how we present our solutions. Okay. Um, there is an assignment. It's got, I think it's 10 questions. Uh, it's called Inequalities and Interval Notation. Okay. Um, and, and like the purpose of this section is to learn interval notation. The best way to learn it is to see experience with inequality.